Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word. We're going to pick it up today, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 23, verse 11. And we're going to wrap up the book of Samuel today. Um, In our last lecture, we left off with David's uh, final song. And then David took time to write down the names of his heroes Uh, And most of these folks were with David from the ragtag army of 200 that grew to 400 and then 600. Uh, David now, we're going to learn in our lecture, has hundreds of thousands under his command as the king of Israel. But uh, these were with David from the beginning and no doubt very special to him and he takes time uh, to write down so that these people would not be forgotten and will remember them today. Uh, You have three levels of his heroes. The first are rank, if you will. The highest rank of his heroes, you have three men in it. Uh, We had Adino and Eleazar that we covered uh, in the last part of our lecture. Today we'll get to Shema, who is the third in the top tier of David's heroes. Then there is a second group of three. Only two of them are named by named. And then we have an additional 32 who are listed in verses 24 through 39. Uh, But they're always referred to as David's 30 heroes. Why? I I don't have a good explanation for that. So we've got a lot of ground to cover today. Let's hit the ground running as we ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day as we pick it up. 2 Samuel chapter 23 verse 11, uh, David's mighty men, the heroes. And after him, meaning after Eleazar, him was Shema, the son of Agi, the Harorite, and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where was a piece of ground. We learn in the Chronicles that this was at Pass Damon is where this occurred, full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. The normal military soldiers of Israel were frightened and ran. Uh, David's mighty men were not in the habit of running from the enemy. They would run to the enemy, rather. Lentils, it's a a leguminous plant that the seeds uh, resemble small beans. Uh, They're popular to eat even into this day in Egypt, uh, northern Africa, uh, along the Mediterranean. Uh, You might recall that when uh, Jacob made a red pottage that uh, Esau wanted uh, that was made of lentils. Uh, There's a red lentil, there are four different kinds, I believe, uh, of the lentils, maybe more than that, but four major varieties of the lentils. And as I said, uh, they make uh, a uh, powder out of the the seeds, I started to call them beans, which would be incorrect, Uh, but then they uh, use them and they quickly absorb uh, seasonings and the flavors of other foods that you uh, prepare them with. They're quite popular even to this day. Verse 12, but he, this being Shema, we learn in 1 Chronicles chapter 11 that Eleazar the second in the troop or the rank of three uh, of David's mightiest men was with Shema at this event. He, Shema, stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines and the Lord wrought a great victory. With God on your side, uh, you always have the victory. 
these these were real champions for David. And again, the three uh, top ranking ones, Adino, uh, Eleazar, and Shema by name, verse 13. And three of the thirty chief went down. Now this is a different set of three than what we covered with Adino, uh, Eleazar, and Shema. The thirty chief went down and came to Davis in the harvest time unto the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Raphium. Uh, the Raphium uh, were the giants. Uh, one of the great of the giants was known as Rapha, uh, which thus comes the name the Raphium, which were his descendants. And uh, Rapha was one of the great, uh, probably equal to Anak, of the giants. Verse 14, And David was then in an hold. He was in a safe place in the cave of Adullam. And the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. They had, the Philistines had taken Bethlehem, the, the very birthplace of David. And I can, I can guarantee you that that would not set well uh, with King David having the Philistines in control of his hometown, Bethlehem. Verse 15, And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me a drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Now, this would be the birthplace also, not only of David, but also of Jesus Christ. The living water would be born in Bethlehem. A king wants to be careful what he says out loud and what he asks for when he has people as loyal as David had uh, serving him. All he had to do was say, uh, you know, you can just see him in this cave of Adullam. The Philistines are occupying Jerusalem and, excuse me, Bethlehem. And he says, oh, I just wish that I could have, uh, probably there's no water like water from your home. And, and that's the reason David said this about the water of the well of Bethlehem. Verse 16, And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. He poured out this water from the well of Bethlehem uh, unto the Lord as a drink offering. Why did he do this? Verse 17. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Question. Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. Again, they were champions for David. They were champions for God in supporting God's anointed. Now, what he's saying here is that this it would represent their blood had things not gone well. The, they risked their, their necks to get this water for David, and uh, he would not uh, drink of it. And of course, it would be, uh, again, the, uh, the water of life, the living water that would be, uh, come from uh, Bethlehem. Verse 18. And Abishai, the brother of Joab. Now, we're going to note it's a little, uh, to me, uh, strange that Joab, being the general of David's armies for a good part of his reign as king, not only of all of Israel, but back when he was just the king over Judah as well, Joab is not listed among the mighty men of David. And I think that points back, uh, as we've covered the book of Samuel, I've made it uh, pointed out several times that uh, Joab and David had kind of a love-hate relationship. I don't think that, that David trusted Joab. Uh, after all, uh, Joab murdered Abner and Amasseh 
who were high-ranking military officials, why I think uh, Joab was jealous and wanted the highest position for himself. But Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zariah, was chief among the three, the three listed in verse 13, who went back to Bethlehem to get water out of the well. And he lifted up his spear against 300 and slew them and had a name among the three, among the second three uh, ranking highest of, uh, uh, military officials. All helped David, uh, but God helped them all. They all knew uh, what a spiritual man David was, and they were also spiritual men. Uh, when you start off with a ragtag army of 200, and you're fighting against the armies of Saul, which numbered in the thousands, out, being outnumbered, you know, six to one, seven to one, was not unusual. Uh, the military people who served David knew that the Lord was with them because God delivered them on many, many occasions. <clears throat> Verse 19, was he not most honorable of three? Therefore he was their captain. This is we're talking about Abishai. Howbeit he had attained not unto the first three. He was at the second level of David's uh, heroes, mighty men. He never did attain to the top three, which was uh, Adino, Eleazar, and Shema that we covered at the beginning. Verse 20. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, we learn in First Chronicles uh, chapter 12, verse 27, that Jehoiada was a priest, but he raised a, a warrior in Benaiah. Uh, it would be Benaiah who would kill Shimei uh, and Joab uh, while serving under Solomon. And it might surprise you, well, a priest raised a warrior? Well, it shouldn't surprise you. You see, the priest all carried weapons at this time. The son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, this would be a, a, an area in Judah, who had done many acts, great deeds. He slew two lion-like men of Joab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in the time of snow. These were all very courageous men. They were brave men. Uh, and again, Benaiah not only remained loyal to David, he was also very loyal to Solomon at a time when Adoniah, one of David's other sons, was trying to take the throne away from Solomon. Benaiah uh, supported Solomon. Verse 21, And he, this being Benaiah, slew an Egyptian, <clears throat> a goodly man, and the Egyptian had a spear in his hand. <clears throat> Excuse me. But he went down to him with a staff. Benaiah basically had a shepherd's hook with him. Uh, the Egyptian had a spear and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. In First Chronicles chapter 11, verse 23, this Egyptian is listed at five cubits in height. Uh, depending on whose, cub whose cubit you go by, uh, this Egyptian was between eight and nine feet tall. He was a big one. Uh, and Benaiah went down to him with basically a shepherd's staff, uh, took the Egyptian spear away from him, and slew him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and had the name among three mighty men, among the second tier of the mighty men of David. He was uh, captain of David's uh, bodyguard, royal bodyguards, the Kirathites and the Pelathites, and later the same under Solomon. Verse 23, he was more honorable, he was higher ranking than the thirty but he attained not to the first three. And David set him over his guard. Again, the Kirathites and the Pelathites, the royal bodyguards of King David. Now we're going to skip verses 24 
through 39. It's basically just a list of the 32 men who were uh, part of David's mighty men. I do want to point out two uh, individuals in the list. In verse 24, you have Azahel, uh, the brother of Joab. You may recall Azahel died at a very young age. Uh, he made the mistake of challenging or chasing after Abner, who was a seasoned uh, war veteran. Uh, Azahel was young, he was fast, uh, but uh, he unfortunately, uh, Abner told him, he warned him twice, you turn away from me, uh, I don't want to have to kill you. Joab would never forgive me. Uh, Joab never did forgive Abner for killing Azahel. In fact, uh, he murdered Abner. Also, I want to point out to you in verse 39, uh, one of David's 32 mighty, we have Uriah the Hittite. Uh, you remember that name, I hope, uh, the husband of Bathsheba with whom David had an adulterous affair. So in verse 39, it states that you have 30 and 7 in all. That includes the three of the highest ranking, uh, Adino, uh, Eleazar, and Shema. You have two of the second three ranking named, that being uh, Abishai and Benaiah. And then if you count the individuals listed from 24 through 39, you actually have a total of 32, which comes to a total of the 37 listed in verse 39. Okay, probably wore that out a little bit. Now we come to our final chapter of 2 Samuel chapter 24. Now this backs up in time a little bit from uh, chapter 23. Let's go with it, verse 1. And again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. Now, a couple things on this verse. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled. I think this is referring to, referring to Saul uh, attacking the Gideonites with whom Israel had made a covenant of peace. And you may recall seven of Saul's ancestors uh, were killed as a, as a result of that. Now, in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1, it states that Satan uh, provoked David. This word provoked in the Hebrew is soothe. Uh, by implication, it means to seduce. Uh, also in James chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, we learn that God is not capable of tempting anyone with, uh, with evil, with calamity. God's just not capable of doing that. So uh, again, that's James chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. But that verse 14 there in James goes on to say, but men uh, undo themselves through lust. But uh, I think it was Satan who provoked David. It was ego. Uh, David it started off with 200 uh, in his ragtag army. He's now in command of hundreds of thousands. When he had 200, he depended on God to deliver him. Now he's depending on numbers to deliver him. For the king said to Joab, the captain of the host, uh, the, the army, the military, which was with him, go now through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, the extreme northern boundary of Israel to the extreme southern boundary, all of it, in other words. And number ye the people, that I may know the number of the people. Now, God didn't tell David to do this numbering. God ordered the numberings of Israel in the books of numbers in the early years. But again, it's David's pride, uh, how many people are under me, uh, kind of an ego trip that he's off on. And Joab said unto the king, Now the Lord thy God add unto the people, how many soever they be, an hundred, <coughs> excuse me, an hundredfold. In other words, if there's a thousand of them, may the Lord make it a hundred thousand. If there's a million of them, may the Lord make it a billion of them, a hundred times the number. 
and that the eyes of my Lord the King may see it in your lifetime, in other words. But why doth my Lord the King delight in this thing? God, Joab knew that God had delivered David on many, many occasions, like I said earlier, with only uh, 200 men, not hundreds of thousands of men. Uh, Joab doesn't agree with David, and you know Joab disagreed with David on many occasions. Joab is right this time. David is in the wrong. One thing you see about Joab, too, he might not have been the most popular with David, but he was not a yes man. He, he, he said it like he saw it, and sometimes he was right, sometimes David was right. Verse 4, Notwithstanding, the king's word prevailed against Joab, the king's word usually does, and against the captains of the host. Joab was not alone in protesting this numbering. And Joab and the captains of the host went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel against their better judgment, but they won't be in a huge hurry. Verse 5, And they passed over Jordan, and over onto the east side of Jordan, where you would find the tribes of Gad, Reuben, and half Manasseh, and pitched in a roar. On the right side, this means on the south side facing east of the city that lieth in the midst of the river of Gad, or the valley of Gad, and toward Jazer. And again, Joab is not going to be in any hurry uh, going about this numbering. Then they came to Gilead, also on the east side of Jordan, and to the land of Tatim Hadshi. And they came to Dan Jan, that means Dan in the wood. And they came to uh, and about to Zidon. Now this Zidon would be close uh, to Tyre, uh, the extreme northwest boundary of Israel. They're kind of making a circle as they go. Verse 7, And came to the stronghold of Tyre, and to all the cities of the Hivites, and of the Canaanites. This would be uh, land that was inhabited by Naphtali, Zebulun, and Issachar. And they went out to the south of Judah, even to Beersheba, the most southern uh, boundary of the nation of Israel. Verse 8, So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. A very lengthy numbering. Uh, it was quite a task, uh, and, but it was also a time of peace, which means that the military was not gathered together in one or multiple spots. They were scattered all over the nation. Now in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 6, we learn that Joab and those with him did not number or count the tribes of Levi or Benjamin because Joab saw it as an abomination that David had decided to number the, the troops of Israel, the fighting men. And Joab gave up the sum of the number of the people unto the king. And there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men that drew the sword. And the men of Judah were 500,000 men. All in all, to combine, you had 1,300,000 troops that were under David. In biblical numerics, the number 13 is rebellion and apostasy. And David's heart smote him after that. His conscience uh, smote him for exalting himself, that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. And when you in your life realize that you've messed up, that you've fallen short, repent. Go to the Father and tell him, Lord, I, I have really messed up. And I'm sorry, and I, I am really going to do my best not ever to do that again. Repent. 
there is always going to be chastisement. That's part of repentance, is being willing to accept the chastisement. And always remember, God only chastises those he loves, Hebrews uh, chapter 6. Actually, it's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, and the following verses. Verse 11. For when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, this word seer is just another uh, term for a prophet. Uh, he is a prophet of God. He's not bringing uh, good news. Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. There is going to be some correction. David is about to be faced with a very difficult uh, decision. So Gad came to David and told him, and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land? Question. That's option one. Choice two. Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Choice three. Or that there be three days pestilence or plague in thy land. Now advise or decide and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. The him that sent him was Yahweh. Now all three of these choices would uh, greatly reduce the number of fighting men of Israel. And that's what God's point is here. Uh, David, you messed up. And you might say, well, David was the one that messed up. Why is God punishing uh, all these other people and going to take these many lives? Remember in verse 1, again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. It wasn't just David who was messing up. It was the nation of Israel. Verse 14, And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. I'm, I'm severely distressed. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. And let me not fall into the hand of man. David being chased by his enemy for three months was not David's cup of tea. That would not be his style at all. Verse 15, So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed, three days in other words. And there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba, extreme north to extreme south, 70,000 men. Again, that greatly reduced David's uh, census of military troops. Verse 16, And when the angel, this is the destroying angel, uh, the angel of the Lord, stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil. He had pity and, uh, and for the hurt he was causing. And said to the angel that was destroyed the people, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. This Arana is called Ornan in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 15. But David saw the angel of the Lord, the destroying angel, with the sword drawn over Jerusalem. And David spake unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people, and said, Lo, I have sinned, and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. There we have a type for the good shepherd, David, concerned about the people. Again, though, God was angry with the entire nation of Israel. They were messing up. Uh, yeah, David messed up, and what he did was wrong, but uh, we're seeing true repentance on the part of David. He's willing to accept the blame and the punishment that goes along with it. And Gad, this is the prophet, came that day to David and said unto him, Go up. 
rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing place, the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. Now, this altar, of course, would be for offering burnt offerings, uh, peace offerings, etc. This location would, uh, was where Abraham took his son Isaac up to offer him up to the Lord, Mount Moriah. This is also the place where Solomon's temple would be built, verse 19. And David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded, verse 20. And Arana looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Arana went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. In Chronicles, it states that uh, Arana also uh, saw the angel, and he and his four sons ran and hid. Now he sees and recognizes King David and bows to him in abeyance. Verse 21, And Arana said, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? Well, what are you doing here, David? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people, following God's instructions. Whatever it takes to stop the plague, David is willing to do. He's concerned for the sheep, as a good shepherd would be. And Arana said unto David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seemeth good, unto him. Behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice, and threshing instruments, and other instruments of the oxen for wood. You can take my instruments that I use to farm with and, and be for the wood for the fire to offer my oxen. It's a very generous fellow, but these sacrifices are to be made by David, not Arana. David will make that right. Verse 23, all these things did Arana as a king, better translated, O king, give unto the king. And Arana said unto the king, the Lord thy God accept thee. Let the Lord accept your sacrifice. And the king said unto Arana, nay, but I will surely buy it of thee for a price. This is to be my sacrifice, not yours. You always offer your own and the best of what you have. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Now it's David's sacrifice the Lord would accept it. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. And there we have the book of Samuel. Um, was David perfect? No, David wasn't perfect. But I want you to, to realize, too, none of us are perfect. It's just simply not possible in the flesh. We all fall short. We all sin. Uh, one thing that you can say about David is that he never, ever fell away from Yahweh entirely to where he fell into idolatry. Uh, all the future kings of Judah, some of the future kings of Israel after the nation split, would be judged by David as to how they walked with the Lord, whether they walked closely with the Lord or whether they abandoned the Lord and then he thus abandoned them. Lessons that we can learn from the book of Samuel, well, there are many. Uh, I guess if I had to choose one that I would ask you to take away uh, and just store away in your memory banks would be chapter 22 of 2 Samuel where we learn how to have the victory over our enemies. We're in a spiritual war, beloved, and you better be prepared. Uh, of course, who is the enemy? The enemy is Satan. Uh, we learned there in chapter 22 of 2 Samuel that God is our strength. 
Yahweh is our fortress. And if you want to have the victory, you depend on him. If you want to have the victory over Satan, you put on that gospel armor of Ephesians chapter 6, which quenches the fiery darts of Satan. There we have the book of Samuel. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed preparing it. Uh, I appreciate you inviting you, me into your home over the last several weeks as we've uh, made a Bible study of this book of Samuel. Again, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have preparing it. Got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to possibly be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. Uh, please don't ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization by name. We try to teach God's Word in a positive manner. Throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. Please keep your questions of a biblical nature as well. If you're studying via the internet somewhere around the world and not able to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the telephone number. You don't need a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I encourage you to talk to your Father. You can talk to Him like He's your flesh Father. Uh, he's the closest relative that you have. Um, develop your relationship with your Heavenly Father. Uh, that relationship doesn't depend on Him. It depends on you. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Father. We ask you to look upon these. You know their needs, Father. Financial difficulties, uh, marital problems, illness. You know, Father, if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. Uh, we also lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. Watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal in Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. <clears throat> All right, let's get to some questions. First up today, Rena from Mississippi. I do have one question, and that is if I only read along with the prompts on the TV screen and don't have my Bible open all the time, am I still considered studying the Word of God, and will God still bless me? Well, yeah, I'd say that you're studying the Word of God when you study with the chapel. Uh, I like to see people have their Bible out for two reasons. I think there are two benefits to, to actually having your Bible in front of you. One, you can make notes in your Bible if you have it open and, and the proper, proper writing instruments. Um, and there's nothing wrong with making notes in your Bible. A lot of people think, oh, that's, that's uh, degrading or, or desecrating uh, my Bible to make notes. No, if you intend to be used of God in teaching or planting seeds, you need notes in your Bible to click your memory so that when you're planting seeds, you can call the proper scripture. Uh, the second reason or benefit of having your Bible actually open is you learn 
where the books are located in the Bible. Uh, all too often I've sat down at Bible studies and someone, when you say, okay, open your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel, they don't have a clue where the book of Ezekiel is. They immediately grab their book and they look at the thumb index and they're looking for, where's Ezekiel, where's Ezekiel? Uh, it's, it's important that you know where the books of the Bible are. And if you're watching uh, the Bible as it appears on the character generator on your screen, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to relate where that book is located in God's Word. Odette from Florida. We were all living in the first earth age. If we did something horrible or committed sins, do we bring all that with us here in the second earth age? I am so unhappy and lonely being a widow. I thought that maybe all of this awful stuff happening to me is a result of what I did in the first earth age. Also, does punishment also follow us in this age from the first age? No, we're born uh, completely innocent in the flesh. We don't have any memory of what happened in the first earth age. It's like our memory is wiped, uh, like the, the memory on a, a computer is wiped clean. Uh, the hard drive is wiped clean. but. Again, and, and I know you're having trouble, Odette, and I'd, I'd encourage you to find some company, uh, maybe a Bible study or something of that nature, if you have a neighbor or something that you could plant seeds with. Um, there are uh, organizations where elderly people, I, you didn't say you were elderly, you just said you were widowed, you could be young and be widowed, I realize, but. Uh, there are uh, activities that communities have for elderly people, and that helps you deal with the loneliness. You might consider uh, volunteering uh, at, a, at a, a library or something, you know, something I don't know what you're good at, but volunteer where you're able to help people that are less fortunate. Always remember, too, Odette, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And it states there that there's nothing that's going to happen to you that isn't common to man. And God will never allow you to be tempted above what you're able to handle without providing you a way out. Phyllis in Michigan, could you please tell me what kind of tree was the tree of life? Well, it really wasn't any more a tree than the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden was an actual tree. Uh, the tree of life was Jesus Christ. Uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was the serpent, the devil, in the Garden of Eden. Uh, that tree of life will be in the eternity. You can read about it in uh, Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 3. William in Georgia, I would like for you to explain Revelation chapter 14, verses 13 through 20. I don't understand when the Bible speaks of a sickle. Uh, I watch you all every night and you list the channel. Uh, I get a lot out of your teachings. Uh, thanks for helping me understand the Bible. Well, you're welcome. Uh, William, what it's talking about there in Revelation uh, chapter 14, verses 13 through 20, it's talking about when Jesus returns at the second advent, and that's going to be harvest time. Uh, you don't harvest grapes with a sickle, number one, so we know it's spiritual. And when Jesus returns, there is no more flesh, but uh, the cup of God's wrath will be poured out, and that cup uh, being poured out is uh, symbolized by the blood up to the horse's bridles uh, in verse 20 of Revelation chapter 14. But keep in mind, we're not in flesh at that point, but spirit, spiritual bodies only. Jane in Indiana, does spiritual discernment 
mean we should stay away from some people. My spirit tells me sometimes there must be a fine line in not to judge others and not having anything to do with others. I'm confused. Please, your thoughts, okay? Well, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 14 uh, tells us that if any man obey not our epistle, the word of God is what the epistle, epistle means a letter, uh, note that man and have no company with him. So, in other words, when you don't want to become holier than thou in judging other people as sinners. Part of our responsibility to help God's children who lost in this world of darkness is to plant a seed and to teach them. And if you completely uh, stay away from them, you're not going to be doing what you're supposed to do. But what that means in Second Thessalonians is don't move in with them and take on their actions. But God does not like people who are holier than thou. Isaiah chapter 65, I believe it's verse 5, states that those who are holier than thou are like smoke in God's, eye, uh, God's nose. Janus in Pennsylvania, does the word blaspheme mean to hinder or prevent or to stop the Holy Spirit from speaking through you as according to Luke chapter 12, verse 10. Uh, the word blaspheme in Luke uh, chapter uh, 12 is blasphemio, very similar to our English word blaspheme. That's, of course, the Greek. It means to vilify, to make someone a villain, in other words. It also means to speak impiously. Uh, that means to not show uh, respect or reverence, especially for uh, the Lord. It's translated in the King James Version Bible, of course, as blaspheme. Uh, it's also to defame, uh, to rail on, revile, or to speak evil of. Rhonda in North Carolina, how can I get these demon spirits out of my house? Where in the Bible does it show how to get them out in Jesus' name? Well, we learn in Luke chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, that we have power over all of our enemies, including uh, demonic spirits, in the name of Jesus Christ. That includes Satan himself. In James chapter 5, verse 14, it states that if any of you are ill, uh, to go to the elders and to anoint with oil. If your house is sick, you can also anoint your house with oil. That's olive oil. And if you don't know how to do that, go to your local grocery store, uh, purchase some 100% uh, virgin olive oil. I would recommend that you get a small vial from your pharmacist. Would probably be happy to sell you an empty vial set aside a small portion of the oil for anointing. And you go to prayer in prayer to the Lord and you say, Father, I'll use this oil in obedience to you, knowing that the power is not in the oil, but your power. And then you take a small amount of the oil on your forefinger, uh, anoint the doorpost of your home, uh, the, the door jams, in other words, and order all evil out in the name of Jesus Christ. Fill your home with Jesus Christ. Evil spirits don't like Jesus Christ. Barbara in Arizona, did the six-day creation know God before the eighth-day creation? Well, it isn't written uh, whether God made himself known to the six-day creation, which was created in the peoples who were created in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, you follow with the second question, God married Jerusalem. Uh, the word says he divorced Israel. Is there a hidden meaning in this? No, there's not a hidden meaning, but most people don't know that God was married and, and divorced. He was married in Ezekiel uh, chapter 16, verse 8. And you have to understand a Hebraism, a figure of speech, which means that when a man spreads his skirt over a woman, they're married uh, in God's eyes. 
God was divorced in, from Israel, as you stated in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8. Again, no hidden meanings. Carolyn from Oregon. Are the people on the right side of the gulf teaching those on the wrong side? No, the gulf uh, cannot be traversed at this time. You can't, you can't travel from the wrong side of the gulf to the good side or vice versa. Um, also, is your mother still alive? No, my mother, uh, Anna Murray, passed away with the co-founder of Shepherd's Chapel along with Pastor Arnold Murray passed away in 1997. All right, Delcy in Nevada. I have a two-part question. First, when Satan is here and we are to stock up on food and pretty much stay at home, will we be able to get electricity and utilities? And God will provide for those in, for his elect. Uh, remember when Moses brought Israel out of Egypt, there wasn't any water. Uh, Moses prayed and God brought water to the people from the rock. There wasn't any food. Uh, Moses prayed and the Lord brought manna from heaven. So uh, if you're one of God's elect, don't worry. God will provide what you need to accomplish his will. Kim in California, we're studying in the book of Amos chapter 2, verse 12. Was Samson a Nazarite? Uh, love always Kim. Yes, Samson uh, was a Nazarite. Actually, he didn't take the vow himself. Uh, he was a Nazarite uh, by God's design from birth. Uh, Judges chapter 13 uh, verses 4 and 5 will document that. He was not to uh, drink wine uh, nor to cut his hair. Rick in Ohio, can you tell me why God decided to have us go through this life? That's a good question. You know, most people don't realize what are we doing here? Why did God put us here in, on earth in the flesh? And that's kind of an important question for people to understand. He did it because he didn't want to destroy one-third of his children that rebelled against him and went with Satan. They followed Satan in the first earth age. And God could have just said, okay, that's it. One-third of my children, I'm just going to destroy them. They're souls, not a flesh. It's hard for people to distinguish between flesh and and soul. The second death is the death of the soul. God did not want to destroy one-third of his children. That's the reason for this, the second earth age. Uh, we're born in the flesh. Uh, most of us are given free will. We can follow God or Satan. But he also sent his only begotten son in this, the second earth age, Yeshua, which if you translate it means Yahweh's Savior his salvation for the world. You know, men try and create their own salvation, the Tower of Babel. Well, if it ever floods again, like in the days of Moab, we can climb that stairway to heaven. Nope, it won't work. Well, we could clone ourselves and live forever. Nope, won't work. Salvation, Jesus Christ, the only way. Ramona in Wisconsin. Do you have to be baptized in a church to go to heaven? I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for my sins. Do you have to be baptized of water in a church to go to heaven? Many falsely teach that John chapter 3 verse 5 where it states you have to be born of water to enter the kingdom of God means you have to be baptized. That's not what it's talking about. To be born of woman means to be born in the flesh. What's the first thing that happens when a woman is about to birth a child? The water breaks. So uh, that's opposed to the fallen angels who refuse to be born a woman. They will not be in the kingdom of God. The criminal that was crucified on the cross next to Jesus, he believed in that very hour that he would die. What did Jesus say? This day I will see you in paradise. 
Do you think that criminal came down off the cross and was baptized? No. And John 3.16 says nothing about being baptized. Having said all that, Jesus is our example. He was baptized. So is baptism a good thing? You bet. Uh, it's stating that you believe that Jesus Christ was born in the flesh, that he died for your sins on the cross and went into the tomb and, praise God, three days later, resurrected. M.W. in Michigan. I heard Pastor Murray say on many occasions, by studying God's Word, we make His day. Can you please explain what he means by God's day? That's a figure of speech that, that means that it makes God happy uh, when He sees you studying His Word. And in other words, it makes... Uh, it is a highlight of his day, is what it makes his day means. Chris in Alabama, I just heard you talking about how you should or should not pay tithes. Why do we have to pay tithes to a church or a building? Why can't we give 10% to someone who is hungry or someone who is homeless? Well, you can do that, but it doesn't ensure what a tithe is intended to do which is to ensure that the Word of God continues to be taught. What you're talking about is more alms helping those who are less fortunate. A tithe is intended to keep the Word of God being taught. I am out of time. I love you all a great deal because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. It does make His day. And when you make His day, He is going to make yours. That's when the blessings start to follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing that's most important, it's this. You stay in his word every day in your father's word is a good day, even with problems. Do you know why? It's because Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, he is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.